He's risen. He's risen indeed. Amen. Well, in the timeless way through the ages, the Church of Jesus Christ would have said, Christos Anesti, He is risen. And we'll teach you some Greek this morning. The correct response to that is Alethos Anesti, or truly He's risen. He's risen indeed. And we get to celebrate those great truths on this Resurrection Sunday morning as we gather together. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who not only suffered and died to purchase our redemption, but indeed rose again on the third day, that we could be, uh, achieve the wonderful state of eternal life through the power of the resurrection that He brings to us. In fact, it's my privilege this morning to welcome you as we come to worship this morning, and it is indeed a joyous day. Friday is a day tinged with some joyful, bittersweet sadness as we consider what the Lord Jesus Christ went through for us. Uh, but with the joyful expectation and indeed certainty of the third day to come. And it's our privilege this morning to be able to gather together and to focus on the risen Christ. And we do pray that our hearts and our voices may well be lifted high in the praise and the, and the adoration of the one who indeed is risen. Well, okay, having said all of that, let's turn our attention then to the Word of God on this Resurrection Sunday morning and uh, consider the words of the Apostle Paul recounted for us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just the first five verses. It is a lengthy chapter. It's a glorious chapter about hope and glorification and resurrection and our resurrection and what is to come and our Christ has uh, uh, conquered. But the Apostle Paul prefaces all of that with these words. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 and following. Let's hear the word of the Lord. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Thanks be to God for the reading of His Word. And with that in mind, folks, let's pray together before we respond to those great truths with a number of the songs that we've chosen to enable us to worship our risen Christ this morning. Our God and Father, we come before You joyfully and humbly on this Resurrection Sunday morning is mindful of the great hope and the joy and the victory uh, that we have because Christ has achieved that uh, through what he accomplished uh, by bursting from death into life on that wonderful third day. So Father God, we do pray that as we gather together this morning that we would be mindful of the great historical truths of the gospel, that Jesus indeed was born, that he lived, that he suffered, that he died, that he rose, and that he is ascended. And Father, we do pray that uh, those rich truths would be a source of encouragement to us as we come and as we worship Him and see the life and the vigor and uh, the great benefits of the gospel uh, that uh, He has achieved for us. So come and uh, bless our time together, cause your spirit to be at work, both informing our minds and igniting our hearts uh, with those wonderful, rich gospel truths we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, if you have your copy of God's Word with you, won't you turn with me to John chapter 20. We are in uh, John chapter 19 on Friday morning as we track through some of the events of Good Friday and we want to see how the Apostle John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God comes to give us the fulfillment, the continuation of that story with uh, great joy after considering the suffering and the death and the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're welcome to follow along on the screen or in your copy of God's Word, uh, John chapter 20 for this morning, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through to 18. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there in the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I have been sending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. But why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 20, the portion of scripture that I've already read for us. And we want to proceed through that at high speed today. There are numerous twists and turns in that passage with different characters. But uh, we want to focus our attention particularly on Mary as uh, we see her revealed through the inspired portion of scripture that John has uh, given to us. And folk, with that in mind, let's bow together in prayer and ask for the help of the Lord by His Spirit to come and indeed teach us and instruct us, but indeed through the eyes of faith to behold, like Mary, the risen Christ. Father, we're thankful for the fact that we can come and we can open up your word, which is inspired, which is authoritative, which is inerrant. All of the details here are recorded for us or perfectly true and we are thankful for the great confidence that that gives to us but Lord even as we come to read and study and reflect and uh, engage our, our minds this morning we are mindful that without you we can do nothing we desperately need the illuminating enlightening power of the Spirit of God and so father in the words of the song that we know and frequently sing as a prayer before the preaching O breath of God come and fill this place. Revive our hearts to know your grace. And from your slumber make us rise that we may know the risen Christ. A word of God so clear and true, renew our minds to trust in you. And give to us the bread of life that we may know the risen Christ. Come Holy Spirit and point us towards the Savior, towards the victor, towards the one who is worthy towards the one who rose and now is seated at the right hand of the Father. Glorify him, even through the preaching of your word we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Just on two weeks ago, you would have heard the news feeds of that devastating school shooting that unfolded in Nashville, Tennessee. Certainly not uncommon in the United States of America, sadly so. That uh, young lady burst into that school with some firearms. It was a private Christian elementary school. It seems she had been a student there once upon a time and uh, let rip. And as a result of that, three staff members and three little children of around nine years old were killed. Chad Skuggs is the senior pastor at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Nashville. And in God's providence, it just so happened that his nine-year-old daughter, Haley, was one of those that were killed in that particular incident. The next day, on the Tuesday of this week, he released a single-sentence statement to the media as he engaged with reporters. And all he had to say was this. 
through tears, we trust that she is in the arms of Jesus, who will raise her to life once again. Just listen to that again. Through tears, we trust that she is in the arms of Jesus, who will raise her to life once again. Folk, what gives such certainty? How is it possible to have such hope in the midst of such heart-wrenching pain and loss? I mean, we look at the words of the Apostle Paul as he writes there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he says, I do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you may grieve or not grieve, as, at least as those who have no hope. In other words, it's possible to be grieving, it's possible to experience the loss, but in a way that is not catastrophic, in a way that we don't fall apart, in a, in a way that still shows the hope and the joy that we have in Christ. How is it possible to look at death, tragic death, catastrophic death like Skuggs did, and still have hope? How is it possible to grieve, but not in a way that is marked by falling apart, and despair, and depression, and absolute hopelessness? Maybe the issues for us this morning go beyond just loss and beyond just bereavement. Maybe we just need to look at life in general in the midst of a fallen, broken, sin-affected Genesis 3 world that we, that we live in. And ask the question, how is it possible to live with life, or to live at least with hope and purpose and joy in the midst of a world that is marked by so much pain? We can see the effects of human sinfulness around us in sickness and disease and corruption and the godlessness and the multiple afflictions that affect people and the trials that come at us from different angles and in different ways, the, the multicolored, the multi-factored uh, level trials that James speaks about in James chapter 1. And we know that we're affected by this. We're not immune as Christians and we're certainly not uh, bubble wrapped from that even as a Christian community here at the Randburg Baptist Church. Even as we sit here this morning, I'm fully aware of the despair and some of the black holes that some of you are in, the pit of despair, what, what John Bunyan wrote about in Pilgrim's Progress, the slough of despond that we sometimes get sucked into and we find it difficult to get out from. I know some of the absolute hopelessness that affect, affects some. I know some of the effects of sin and guilt and the baggage and the burdens that are carried as a result of things done and things said. And so far we look back and ask the question, how is it possible in the midst of all of those realities that are so crushing to live with victory and to live with certainty and to live with joy and to live with hope in the midst of all of the stuff that is swirling around and uh, pressing down upon us. Well, folks, this morning we want to lift our eyes beyond those realities and to consider the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to consider the resurrection this morning and to see some of the importance and some of the implications that the empty tomb actually brings to us, not in some abstract, super spiritual, ethereal way, but in real tangible ways as we live and worship and walk with the risen Christ. We're certainly going to focus our attention on the historical truths because Jesus did rise again and that in and of itself fosters great hope for us. But I pray that beyond that, that we would find our own stories resonating with that of Mary Magdalene as revealed in this portion of Scripture. And like her, be moved from a state of woeful despair, if that's you, to a place of indeed worshipful delight in Christ and who he is, and what he's done for us. We left off the story on Friday, did we not, with the death of Jesus on Calvary. The gospel writers continue to teach us about the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is just another proof that he was actually very, very dead and lifeless. We considered on Friday how he as the king of glory, suffered, and died in our place as a substitution, as a sacrifice for our sins, dying the death that we should have died. Jesus is hanging on a cross as the one who said it is finished, at less time. Everything was done, the work had been accomplished. But if John finished off there, and if John put his pen down at that point, 
the story of Jesus Christ would be important, it would be fascinating, it would be intriguing, but it certainly would be incomplete. It would not be exceptional. If we look at other characters from history, all human biographies in some or other way end with death. The main character dies, the main character is buried, there is a memorial, there is a funeral, there is a, a gravestone and uh, tears and memories that unfold. And if that was just the case with Jesus, he would be no different from any other person in history. We would be left with an incomplete picture. A man of exceptional character, a great prophet, a great preacher, a, a great teacher, a person of great compassion, but whose sincerity and comfort and love would not be doubted in any way as we read the accounts through the Gospels, but we would be left with question marks. What about the statements that he, that he made? What about the claims that he made about himself? What about the promises that he made to his disciples and by extension to us even today? Where was the, the promised glory and the anticipated glory? Because there certainly wasn't any as he hung and died there on a Roman cross. If John put down his pen at that point, we would be frustrated. In fact, we would be shortchanged if John just ended with the cross and the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as the Holy Spirit directs John to keep writing, he doesn't end there because there is more to come. The rest of the story had not yet been written, and we need to consider that even as we come to John chapter 20 this morning. It is a glorious chapter, a chapter in which we see light and life and hope bursting through the pages and the words of Scripture. John, as he writes, writes a story that in some subtle way involves himself. He refers a few times to the disciple whom Jesus loved and uh, the very best claim is that, that that is John himself. As I said to you earlier, there are characters, there are movements, there are events, there are conversations that, that have. But what we see in John 20 is a dramatic shift from despair to joy, from hopelessness to a position of great joy and anticipation and victory. As we come to this chapter, I want to cut through some of the other characters and some of the other events that would be a sermon for a different time. Maybe next year as we come to Resurrection Sunday, there's enough in that to come back to. But I want to dig down this morning onto the character of Mary Magdalene and engage with her and to see how her whole perspective and her life is turned upside down on that wonderful morning. Let's walk with Mary and see and maybe resonate together with her how she changes from woeful despair to worshipful delight in the person of the risen Christ. Before we delve into Mary herself, let's just get a view of the story in broad brushstrokes and fly over this at high speed this morning. And consider the events of that Resurrection Sunday morning as given to us through the pen of the Apostle John. The other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, fully in different details, and we've always got to be careful to try and work out the jigsaw puzzle in terms of the chronology and the events and who said what and, and so forth. We're not going to get lost in all of that detail this morning, but just use John's framework as inspired scripture. Have a look with me there at verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Well, let's just hit the pause button there for a moment, folk, and get to grips with this character. John is shining the spotlight on Mary Magdalene. Who is she? Why was she important? I think it's a, a crucial for us to just nail that down as our focus will be on her particularly through our study this morning. In Luke chapter 8, Luke the doctor writes this for us in the first couple of verses. And he says this. Soon afterwards, he, that's Jesus, went on through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. Luke gives us an important 
angle here. There are a group of women that Jesus has healed. He's healed them of spiritual affliction. He's healed them of spiritual affliction. And Mary Magdalene was one of those. She was affected by seven demons. And the Lord Jesus Christ, as God, had expelled those demons from her and liberated her from evil, liberated her from oppression, and brought her to a place where she had embraced him as the Lord Jesus Christ and the Messiah. And she, in a sense, was part of the support team, in fact, probably the leader of the support team of these women who traveled with the 12 disciples caring for Jesus and cooking for them and cleaning for them and mending for them and supporting them financially out of the means that they actually had. So although Mary Magdalene wasn't a disciple in terms of the 12, she was certainly a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. She loved the Lord immensely and would have been with him all the way through his ministry from that point onward. As we fast track and just jump around, uh, even in John's Gospel, we can see that as a devoted follower of Christ, Mary was present at Calvary as the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. We read that in John chapter 19 and verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. She is an eyewitness of the suffering and the humiliation of her beloved Lord uh, as he suffered and died there on Calvary. Mary was also present at the burial of Jesus. And we pick that up again in Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 23 and verse 54. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The woman who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. And on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. So we can see Mary, witness of the the crucifixion, a witness of the burial. And she's got it in her mind to go back there later on after the Sabbath and do what they couldn't do in their haste late on the Friday. This lady was a devoted disciple of Christ. This lady, Mary Magdalene, deeply mourned the death of Jesus Christ. She fervently wanted to see, to see his body being honored through a proper burial that they were not able to effect. And that's where John picks up the story as he comes to chapter 20. And so Mary goes to the tomb early on that Sunday morning. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Now again, folk, we piece it together with the other gospel writers, and we can certainly get the sense that she was not alone. Other women were with her, and they were all concerned about the need to get into that tomb and to gain access. In fact, John tells us that that in John chapter 16, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, uh, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Now, John doesn't get lost up in the other detail of the other woman who were with Mary. His focus is on her and we want to honor that as we come to our study this morning. If you want to look at the time frames, that's your homework. And take a good study Bible or a commentary and in, in your own time you can work and piece out the actual events and the, more, the details of all, how this all hangs together. But John is moved to bring us face to face with Mary. And so we track with John this morning and look and learn from the example and the encounter of Mary Magdalene with Christ. When she eventually gets to that tomb, something's off. Something's wrong. The picture is not as she was expecting. The way they left on Friday is not the same. Something's been moved around. And the glaring thing through the gloomy half-light as they approach, and as she approaches there, is this. That the stone that blocked the entrance to that uh, cold tomb had been moved. The stone had been rolled away. While it was still dark, she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Mary in that moment panics and she runs back into the city, back into Jerusalem to the other disciples wherever they were and she advises them the stone's been moved, the the tomb has been opened up, there's, there's a problem. 
And Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, which is probably John, dash across back to the tomb, or probably with Mary behind them. Peter's the slower one, John's the athlete, and John gets there first. And when they get there, they notice that is true. The stone had been rolled away, and they go in and they notice that the grave clothes are lying there, but Jesus' body is missing. And John gives us that detail to pretty much prove the point that this is not the work of grave robbers who were certainly at work in the area at the time. He's wanting us to see the body of Jesus Christ is not there. It wasn't a robbery. It wasn't an accident. The Lord is risen. And as we just read through the story at high speed, it seems as if John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, gets it. The penny seems to drop for John but for Peter and the rest of them, and Mary, who is by this stage caught up with them, they don't seem to get it. They're still swirling around in their grief and their confusion. And we can see that there in verse 8. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. But as for the rest, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to their homes. When Begs, it kind of begs the question, what were they thinking in those moments as they just walk back with all of this stuff running through their minds? See, Jesus had repeatedly told them that he would die and that he would rise. But in these moments, they just don't get it. They had heard him speak of that multiple times, but it hadn't become an internal reality for them that he indeed would die and that he indeed would rise. And Mary is not in any way different from them. She had also sat, she had also heard, she had also heard Jesus teach on these issues, but she had not truly heard him and embraced those realities by faith. So Mary remains there at that tomb. And John highlights for us what she saw and what she did and whom she encountered. And as we consider Mary this morning and her responses, some wonderful, rich, exciting, exhilarating lessons start to emerge for us. As I looked at the story and read it backwards and forwards, two key looks emerged for me in terms of Mary. Two key looks where she gazes two times on different things. And as we see and consider those two looks this morning, we can see the dramatic shift in her life and perspective from that of woeful despair to worshipful delight and wonder and joy in the risen Christ. And I do trust that the Lord would in, indeed impress those two lessons on our own hearts and minds this morning. Firstly, folk, Mary looks with woeful despair. Mary looks with woeful despair. She arrives at that tomb early on the Friday morning with raw grief, the reality of what happened on Calvary had deeply impacted her. We know from the New Testament that death is described as an enemy. Death is described as something that stings, that is harmful, that hurts. And Mary Magdalene had faced that dark enemy and still continued to do so. Mary Magdalene had been deeply stung by the loss of the Lord Jesus Christ, her Lord, her Messiah, the one whom she loved and the one who had set her free. Her Lord was gone. She had witnessed that on the Friday at Calvary. And that was the cold, gripping, tentacle-like reality that was encompassing her heart even on that Friday morning. Jesus was gone. Jesus was buried. Jesus is no longer here. Jesus is no longer uh, is not coming back. And I no longer have the opportunity to meet with him and to speak with him and to enjoy him and his company and his ministry. That pain gripped the heart of Mary Magdalene. And folks, that's exactly what death can do. We move beyond her to ourselves this morning. We know from Scripture that the wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, but also spiritual death. But there is a consequence. When God spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden, He said to them, You can eat from any tree in the garden except for that one, the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. And when they did, death entered the world. 
Our relationship with God was shattered spiritually, but the realities of physical death became something that every single human being will be touched by in some or other way during our lives and our earthly existence. Loved ones die. Bodies give up. Disease grips people and strangles life out of those that we know and those that we love. Accidents and trauma and Nashville shootings happen. We know the sting. We've come face to face with the enemy. All of us in some or other way have experienced the loss and the grief and the pain of that dark reality enveloping us. We identify with Mary Magdalene in her woeful despair because we've been there and we're going to be there again. But in her pain she comes. She comes dutifully to honor him and to work on the embalming with the spices and the ointments that they had prepared and when she gets to that tomb with her heart broken, her world crumbles even more. She looks at where the stone should be and it's rolled away. And she makes an assumption. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Mary's already overcome with grief and loss, but that just gets cranked up to a different level. A little later on as the story unfolds, and she ventures closer and bends down and actually looks in. In verse 11, we see this. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. Mary looks. She's come to tend the grave. She's come to tend the body of Jesus. But when she looks, the body isn't there. The stone has been moved for crisis number one, but now the body is also not there and the grave clothes are present and she comes to the same conclusion as Peter and John. Jesus is no longer here. Someone's taken him. Something's wrong with this picture. In these moments as she looks, her whole focus is, is downward on a dead body, but now also a missing body. Even when the angels come and speak to her in that tomb, in the gloomy murkiness, She's gripped by her own loss and grief. Have a look there at verse 11. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped down to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. If I just get this in these moments, the angels are not asking her that question because they in any way need information. The angels are trying to prod Mary into a realization of what has actually happened that she's just so blinded to in her moments, in those moments. They come and they ask the question, woman, why are you weeping? It's kind of a mild rebuke. They're trying to get her to, to think along these lines, Mary wake up just just look beyond what you're seeing here in the in the here and now can't you see haven't you realized what's actually happened here in in this tomb but her grief and her despair just creates such a mental fog for her and she can't see through the issues she's blinded by her own tears even as she looks there in that tomb even when Jesus himself comes and appears and speaks to her, she's still caught up in grief, still blinded by her own tears. We read that there in verse 14. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She's blinded. The resurrected Christ is right there in front of her, but not immediately apparent to her. And Jesus, just like the angels, gently engages Mary Magdalene in conversation to try and shift her mind to the reality of what has just happened. Again, like the angels, he asks the question, Woman, why are you weeping? And he follows that up with the question, Who are you seeking? 
See what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to get inside her mind and to shift her perspective. He's trying to stir her to think and to answer a question. I'm, I'm seeking the body of Jesus. I'm seeking the Christ, the, the Messiah, my Lord, my Master, my teacher, my rabbi, the one who, on whose every word I hung, the, the one who repeatedly told us that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and be, and be killed. And, and, and on the third day, and on the third day, and on the third day be raised. That's where they're trying to get her th thinking in line with, to remind her and to ask what kind of Messiah, what kind of Lord are you actually looking for? Why are you here seeking the, the living among the dead? Mary, think back to what he said. Think back to what he taught. Think back to those words that you love to hear. You're missing that last phrase. You're so hung up on the fact that he would die that you've missed Je what Jesus said in terms of the resurrection. But even the angels and Jesus can't move Mary to consider what she should have known. But what we see there in that tomb is a picture of despair. It is a picture of hopelessness in the face of death. And tears and loss dominate Mary Magdalene's response. All she can see as she looks is darkness and blackness and hopelessness and depression and futility and loss. But in the darkness, amidst that hopelessness, in the swirling black despair, Mary Magdalene hears a voice. The voice is one word to her. Maria. Mary. And the entire story, folk, is turned on its head in that moment. What we see there in verse 16 is the very climactic point of the entire story of John chapter 20. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. This is the climax. This is a radical moment. Because in that moment, Mary's woeful, gripping, black despair is turned on its head and transformed in milliseconds to joy and delight and worship. Secondly, this morning, let's consider Mary looks, not now with woeful despair, but Mary looks to see who spoke with worshipful delight. Just one word calls to return, Mary can you imagine the moment she turns incredulously with wonder, with awe, with amazement, with shock, and there in front of her beholds the risen Christ. The person that she saw isn't the gardener. It is Jesus. He's there. He's real. He's alive. So I'll just let that sink in this morning. In the dark depths of what Mary was experiencing in her pain and despair, hope comes like a brilliant halogen spotlight into the midst of all of that. The one who was dead is alive. The one whose body seemed to be lost there from the tomb is standing right there with her. The one who was being mourned over actually speaks. The one who suffered and died there on Calvary's tree in a bruised, battered body, bloody and abused in every conceivable way, is standing in front of her and speaking to her and calling to her. The one who offered hope and life but died with all of that seemingly unfulfilled is now there with life offering hope and victory again. Again, folk, there are events in here that we need to piece together from the various Gospels. It's again, some homework for you later on today. But in those moments, she acknowledges the Lord Jesus Christ, Rabboni, teacher, my Lord, my master, the one to whom I submit. It seems that Mary in those moments clung to Christ 
She just doesn't want to let him go. She's got him back again. Mary had the first encounter. The others seemed to be just behind. But it seems that all of them actually fell down at Jesus' feet. Matthew tells us that. And they came up and took hold of his feet and they, they worshipped him. Why? That was right. That was appropriate. Humble adoration and, and worship at the feet of the risen Lord Jesus Christ was the most appropriate response in that situation. They were giving recognition to Christ's worth as the Messiah, as the Savior and the Lord, but not a Messiah, Savior and Lord hanging on a cross, but one who has burst to life again. They are in the presence of the risen Christ. In those moments, Jesus speaks to her. We see that there in verse 17. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to, my, to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. What was Jesus saying to her and to the others in that moment? Yes, Mary and others, it's appropriate to worship. It's appropriate to adore, but I'm not going anywhere. You don't have to cling to me in those moments. I'm still here. I'm still, still going to be present for a season. I'm still going to live that 40 days on earth as the resurrected Christ before the ascension and I return back to my Father's glory in heaven. Mary, you can let go. Chill. You don't have to panic. I'm not going anywhere a second time. But Mary, here's the thing. I want you to go back to Jerusalem. Go back and tell the disciples. Go back and tell my brothers that I'm alive. Go back and share this message. Be the first evangelist of the Evangelion, on the good news and say Jesus died and he was buried and praise God he is alive again and you get to have the privilege of communicating that to them in Jerusalem. Indeed, he is the victor. The Apostle Paul says that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Mary, you hasten back and you tell them Jesus Christ is the victor. He is one. He is alive. Let your hope be fueled. Don't live in despair. So what does Mary do? There in verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and she announced to the disciples, what? I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Sadly, the others don't believe her. They're too blinded by their own grief, by their own despair. They're still looking with woeful despair in a sense in terms of their own response. And uh, as we read there in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 16 verse 9, we can see just the, the lack of responsiveness even from the others. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. And she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. There's just this widespread spiritual blindness and refusal to accept that Jesus Christ has actually been risen. That's not our focus this morning, folk. Dwell on Mary. She beholds the risen Christ. And the faith-based words of wonder burst from her lips. I have seen the Lord. When she first arrived, she looked at a, at a stone that had moved and an empty tomb. And her woeful despair just grew more and more and more. But now she's looked upon the risen Christ and everything changes. There is worship. There is wonder. There is joy and there is delight. I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. Just think about it this morning, folk, as we poke and prod into that a little bit more. What changed for Mary in that moment? What actually changed for her in that moment when she encounters Christ? I think it all made sense. I think everything made sense. The penny dropped for her. Everything came together for Mary in that moment. All of the Old Testament scriptures that she probably grew up knowing came alive. For example, Psalm 16, verse 10 and 11, where we read, <clears throat> excuse me, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. 
at your right hand are pleasures for, forevermore. That is messianic. That is a prophecy given about what would happen to Christ. Yes, he would suffer. Yes, he would die. But he would not see corruption. He would be raised to life again. And David gets that right there in Psalm 16. And Mary, when she sees him, goes, Amen. It's true. It's real. That prophecy actually is fulfilled. Incidentally, folk, I had some WhatsApp exchange a day or two ago. I think it was on Friday evening with our brother Brian Forbes, who's still across in New Zealand. And he just said, even as he's grappling with his own bereavement after the loss of Kim, these words, Psalm 16, 10 and 11, were ministering to his own soul. Christ is alive. There is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And Mary could see that coming to life, even in front of her. The fulfillment of that was standing in front of her. I have seen the Lord. Then she would have thought about the words of Jesus Christ that she had heard even as they traveled together and he taught on many occasions. For example, early on, uh, early on in Jesus' ministry, he had gone up to Jerusalem over the Passover, not the events here in the Passion Week, but much earlier. And as he went there, he cleaned out the temple because they had turned it into a place of trade and commerce and that upset the Jews and they interrogated him who are you to do these things and early in Jesus ministry and Mary would have probably heard the story it's recounted for us in John 2 we read this the Jews said to him what sign do you show us for doing these things and Jesus answered them destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up and then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore, don't miss this. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. I think that includes Mary Magdalene. It made sense all of a sudden. Jesus spoke about being raised in three days, and here he is in front of me. I have seen the Lord. The penny drops for her. Mary no doubt heard often what Jesus had said that often predicted, uh, or that often repeated prediction, where Jesus often said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed but on the third day be raised. And you read through the gospel accounts and that is injected again and again and again and again. Mary would have heard that, but she hadn't by faith grasped that final clause that on the third day he would be raised again until she's standing there in the tomb looking at Jesus Christ. And she's able to burst out and say, I have seen the Lord because he is indeed risen from the dead. What happened to Mary in those moments? Faith became certainty for us. Having looked with woeful despair at the stone that was moved and the missing body of Jesus Christ, she's moved into joy-struck, victorious, triumphant, exhilarating worship at the feet of the risen Christ. Her life and her perspective were radically shifted in the very blink of an eye. Everything that fueled that woeful despair is transformed and undone. And she's rightfully gripped by a sense of worship and delight in the presence of her Lord and Master raised to life again. Folks, as we consider Mary in that way this morning, that's what a glimpse of the risen Christ does. The risen Jesus transforms people. The risen Christ changes perspectives. The reality is that, or the reality that Jesus is alive brings hope and joy and light into the deepest darkness that we may well be afflicted by. And so, folk, having considered Mary, having considered her look in woeful despair and her look in what I've called worshipful delight, where does this leave us here this morning? We're not there in Jerusalem. We're not there at an empty tomb. We're not physically encountering the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, as we start tying the threads together this morning, can I exhort you to look like Mary at the risen Christ, but through the eyes of faith, 
on this resurrection Sunday morning, let your eyes of faith be lifted up to consider the risen Christ. In your own pain, in your own distress, in your own affliction, and for some even here this morning, it's bereavement and loss of uh, things that have unfolded over the last year or so. My friend, you can't have a, an actual experience like Mary. But you can, by faith, encounter the risen Christ. Why don't you do that on this Resurrection Sunday morning? If you're here as an unbeliever in Christ, I'm not sure why you came, maybe not, not even sure yourself why you came. Maybe you were invited or dragged along for an annual excursion. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're hearing this and engaging with this message. But it's possible that you're sitting here this morning not sure of this whole Jesus thing, Bible thing, Christianity thing. There are just too many question marks and this whole death resurrection thing is not real for you. Can I exhort you to see that it is? That this is historical fact, but the historical facts have massive significance for you in terms of your own standing with God. And can I exhort you to, by faith this morning, look like Mary at the risen Christ. Look to the one who conquered death. Look to the one who right now offers hope and joy and victory and forgiveness and purpose to you in your brokenness. <coughs> Consider the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself given to us in John chapter 1 verse 4. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Look to that Jesus by faith and be brought into the life and the hope that he alone offers. John writes in 1 John chapter 5 verse 11, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. If you know that you are not in a state of life this morning spiritually, look to him who broke the power of death on that third day and alone offers the life and the hope that you so desperately need. It's only through faith in him that you can be brought into eternal life. Didn't Jesus himself say that as they recounted for us in John 14 verse 6? I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. That is truth. Jesus broke the power of death and he offers you eternal life if you would believe in him. But don't miss the question Jesus then asks. Do you believe this? Not do you affirm it rationally in your brain cells. Do you believe this? Have you grabbed onto him as the risen Christ and the only way through whom you can be saved? Because if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. There is no other way to come into a relationship with God except through this Christ who died and rose again so that you could be forgiven and set free and be brought into that eternal reality and glory of eternal life that he has accomplished for us. My friend, if that's you this morning, don't put off, don't delay, don't think that you're going to be here next Resurrection Sunday in 2024 and that you've got time to maybe deal with these issues. We don't know. All we know is that we get to face him one day and when we get to face him, we face him as judge. And again, that is rooted in the resurrection because as the Apostle Paul preached in Acts, God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The resurrected Christ is coming back. The resurrected Christ is coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords to judge the living and the dead. And you and I get to stand before him one day as the risen, ascended, returned, glorious one. And what will you say to him on that day? Believe in your heart that he is Lord. And at least confess with your mouth that he is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and be saved this resurrection Sunday morning. But believer, let me speak to you too as we close this morning. These truths should be filling us with joy and delight and hope and victory. Consider what it means to you as it would have meant to Mary. 
Consider the reality of the risen Christ this morning and let your own hearts well up in praise and adoration and worship. Because you too, like her, have a risen Savior. You too, like her, have a living Savior. You too, like her, have a glorious Savior. And unlike her, but through the lens of His Word, by faith, we can say, I too have seen the Lord. May that be your reality this morning. Look at the risen Lord Jesus Christ this morning, Christian, and know that He is the victor. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer, longer has dominion over Him. Christian, look at the risen Christ this morning and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your salvation is secure. For if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Christian, look at the risen Christ by faith this morning and know that your own resurrection one day is guaranteed, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us together with him and bring us with him into his presence. Christian, Look at the risen Christ by faith this morning and know that you have a living hope of what is going to come in the future. Isn't that our Peter writes? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Believer, as you sit here this morning, you have a living hope. Christ is coming back. Christ is making all things new. Christ is correcting every injustice. Christ is going to usher in the new heavens and the new earth where we by faith get to live in the presence of God forever as God dwells with his people and we with him. That's our living hope. Why? Because Christ is risen. Believer, look at the risen Christ this morning and know that he is always with you. Yes, you feel alone at times. Yes, there is loneliness. Yes, you might feel abandoned. Yes, life is hard. But how can Jesus possibly ever fulfill the words, I will never leave you or forsake you if he's not alive, if he's not risen? But because he is, I can face tomorrow. Because he is, all fear is gone. Because I know, yes, I know that he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Those are the realities that we celebrate and hold on to this morning. I have seen the Lord. Look at him through the eyes of faith this morning. But the greatest news in all the world is that Jesus Christ paved a way for us to enter into a saved relationship with God and then exist to love him and to serve him and to enjoy him forever. And to make that possible, Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross at Calvary. And to make that happen, the final part of the story was fulfilled on that glorious resurrection Sunday morning. As the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, shattering the power of death to reign forever. As we worship together this morning, He is our risen Lord. He is our risen Savior. The one whom God has highly exalted and the one to whom one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What do we do with these glorious truths today? Look. Look like Mary. Look through the eyes of faith at the risen Lord and say in your heart of hearts, I have seen him. I have beheld him. I trust in him. I submit to him. Friend, if you're sitting here this morning and you know and trust Christ, let these phenomenal implications filter down into your hearts and your minds. Be encouraged by them. Be confident in them. Let your love for the risen Christ be warmed and go out into this day and into this week and into the rest of this year with a desire to love him and serve him with more fervency and more devotion. He is alive. He is coming back. And hence we have confidence and joy and victory in the midst of all the pain and all the affliction and all the tears and all the despair and all the hopelessness 
that we encounter. He is alive. I have seen the Lord. May that be your reality this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can turn our attention to these wonderful narratives inspired by the very Spirit of God and know that they are factually true. There is no error in these. And Lord, then to know with certainty as your Spirit takes them and applies them to our hearts and our minds that we have indeed a great confidence, that we have great hope, that we have great joy. Impress that on our hearts and our minds this morning. I pray for everyone gathered here on this wonderful Resurrection Sunday morning that they would leave here having indeed experienced the risen Christ and have their lives and their perspectives changed and altered as we leave here. Lord, I would pray for those catching up later on with the audio and the, vis uh, the video, the infirm and those unable to be here. Lord, we do pray that even in their own distress and loneliness and affliction, that you through the power of your Spirit would take uh, what we have read and what we have considered and bring great joy to them, we pray. So continue to do your way in us as we seek to live our lives under the authority of the Lord, risen Lord Jesus Christ. We ask this in his precious name. Amen. And fuck with that in mind, let's stand and indeed raise our hearts and voices together as we end. Jesus is Lord. The cry that echoes through creation. He came, he lived, he suffered, he died. He's risen, he's coming back. Indeed, he is Lord, not just Lord, but the risen Lord. And may we indeed go into this week in the words of the Apostle Paul, in a place where we may know him in the power of his resurrection, that we may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. Go in God's grace and peace this morning, we pray. Amen.